thanks very much for, for the invitation. Um, so I haven't put any of my affiliations up there because I'm just in the process of changing jobs. So I am leaving, leaving as clinical director of, of Kidney Health Australia, although I do hope to maintain a position on their education and advisory committees. And I'll be finishing up at, at uh, Deakin University and I'm starting at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. So I'm kind of right in between jobs at the moment um, as of the end of the next week. Uh, so I am the outlier and I'm going to be talking about uh, some medication use and why uh, I see this as actually a really important uh, topic to, to consider. It certainly doesn't replace, and I really like the, the, the phrase used during the meeting of outsourcing one's health, uh, but I think there are useful adjunct. So just in terms of my disclosures, I, I do prescribe low carb, but I also prescribe medica medications. Uh, in my role within Kidney Health Australia and um, as, a, as, a, as an educator, I've certainly been involved with industry in the last couple of years fairly heavily um, because of these new medications that have arisen. So I've contributed to some education, but also um, uh, documents for, for PBS consideration, uh, PBAC consideration for PBS listing for these medications. I also have some seed funding from Servia. This is a company that makes a blood pressure medication and uh, that's been supporting a project of mine on shared medical appointments, which is really about behaviour change and trying to um, de-prescribe. And I have other fun recent funding sources that are, that are listed there through NHMRC and um, uh, hospital uh, and philanthropic. And just to sort of outline what my research interests and portfolio look like at the moment, uh, it's quite a diverse portfolio, but I don't do anything in clinical trials uh, at this point in time. And none of this uh, information should be considered medical advice. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kidneys and, and kidney health. Uh, so our kidneys are I think quite important. Uh, that's the basis of my career and my life at the moment. So uh, if, uh, for, for those that don't know, we normally, most people are born with two kidneys. They're about the size of your fist and they're located really at the back, just under the rib cage. And as you breathe, they just move down and, and oscillate a little bit. Um, they're, they're really, they are really important organs in the body. They filter the extra water and toxins from the blood and that what's, that's how we produce urine. And they're, they're, very, uh, they're, very, they're very clever in that if we haven't drunk enough uh, fluid, they'll concentrate any fluid we have and you may not pass very much urine or when you do, it's very concentrated. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the opposite side, if you've drunk a lot, you'll be running to the bathroom quite frequently. And when you're offloading fluid, we're also offloading a lot of waste or toxins that build up across the course of the day. So we, we know we're very metabolically active. Our cells are working very hard um, throughout the day, and that creates energy and, and toxins, and we do need to get rid of those toxins, and the kidneys are very important. They balance our electrolytes in our, in our blood, so our, our salt, our potassium, um, our phosphate, calcium are all very reliant on, on, um, on the kidneys. And then the kidneys also produce some hormones, and these hormones are really important for bone health, really important in terms of maintaining our blood pressure, and they secrete a hormone called EPO, which makes red blood cells. So, so are really important. And then, so if people have uh, impairment of their kidney function, there are a lot, of, a lot of symptoms and signs that can develop. And one of the most common conditions that we see is this entity called chronic kidney disease, or, or CKD. And CKD is defined by a drop in the filtration rate of the kidneys, and we detect that on a blood test. Some people will may have heard of the EGFR, and that's really the, the marker of, of your kidney function. And when there's damage to the kidneys, the, the kidneys will leak some protein. And if you can imagine, really, the, the, the filters of the kidney, if you imagine it's like chicken wire, and it's very small holes, and it, it really just allows the fluid and the toxins to, to go out. But if we get a hole in that chicken wire, we start to lose some of um, our really important proteins. And we call that proteinuria, protein in the urine. And those two uh, combined, either either singly or combined is, um, is how we define chronic kidney disease. 
And in Australia and really across the world, the most common cause of, of CKD or kidney disease is, is diabetes, predominantly type 2 diabetes because of the high prevalence, uh, but also hypertension, high blood pressure is, an, is a very common cause. And combined in Australia, they're the most common causes of, of chronic kidney disease and account for probably about 70, 60 to 70% of people with chronic kidney disease. And so chronic kidney disease is common, it's harmful, and it's really costly. So if we, we look at uh, across Australia, there's probably about 2 million people, 2 million Australian adults that are living with chronic kidney disease. The majority of these people don't actually know they've got chronic kidney disease because it is a silent disease. We have we have two kidneys. We can donate a kidney to somebody else for it in a transplant and be completely healthy. So we have a huge reserve of kidney function and we can have damage that is starting to develop in the kidneys and you don't know about it. So it's a, it's a silent disease. This is quite a scary figure, I think, that in the last 20 years, between 2000 and 2020, there's been a more than a doubling of the people, of people who have reached kidney failure. So these are people that need dialysis or live with a transplant to be healthy. And that equates to over 27,000 Australians. Those that reach kidney failure, though, are the survivors, because the presence of kidney disease is associated with premature death, and primarily from cardiac disease. So there's this interrelationship between heart disease and kidney disease. Uh, and I like the saying, if you think heart, think kidneys. If you think kidneys, you think heart. Uh, and uh, from uh, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare that reported 11% of deaths in 2020 were attributable in some way to, to chronic kidney disease. The annual cost of kidney disease is enormous. Um, so through Kidney Health Australia, there was an economic report launched earlier this year that uh, showed the annual cost of chronic kidney disease was in the order of uh, $10 billion. And this includes uh, treatment of uh, chronic kidney disease, kidney failure, but also took into account the impact on um, income, uh, pre presenteeism, absenteeism, uh, et cetera. So prevention, early detection and treatment saves lives. And, and this, is, uh, this is what I want to now really talk about. This was another report that came from Kidney Health Australia a couple of years ago, and it was called Make the Link. And it just emphasises again what I mentioned before. If we think kidneys, we think heart. And we also should be thinking diabetes. So these, thing, these three conditions are very uh, intertwined. And for me, they really represent the same issue. We have underpinning insulin resistance that is driving diabetes. Uh, driving kidney disease, which I'll show in a moment, and also related to heart disease. And about a third of Australians have at least one of these conditions, and that's 5.6 million um, Australians. And many of them, are, are, they coexist. And the impact of that is the so-called ripple effect. And I think this is quite a, a striking um, image in that these conditions intersect and the impact from a personal and societal perspective are, are also overlapping. Uh, and so these conditions are, are very much interrelated. And this interrelationship, I think, has really been borne out now with these medications. These are the SGLT2 inhibitors. They're, um, there's a number of, number of them now, and they all end in flozen. So we heard about the statins, and now we have the flozens. And um, I don't know if anyone was ever called a statinator, but there are now people who call themselves flozinators, and there is a verb to flozinate. So they have really taken off in the last, um, the last few years. And these were initially marketed as a medication for diabetes, and they showed that they um, improved um, hemoglobin A1C modestly, but the effect on the kidneys and on the heart was profound. Uh, which was unexpected and then led to a number of trials that looked at these agents specifically in people with heart failure uh, and people with, with chronic kidney disease. 
And this, is, this has happened very, very quickly in the, in the course of only a few years. And these drugs now have been rapidly incorporated into, um, into guideline management for both heart failure and chronic kidney disease. And it has also changed the diabetes management guidelines in that we're now, they're now talking not only in terms of haemoglobin A1C or glycemic control, but in terms of organ protection. So these agents are available and, and maybe it'll be like the 90s when the statins came out, uh, there'll be discussion about it potentially with, with your um, practitioners. So I'm going to focus really on what is the evidence in kidney disease uh, and what a number of trials now have shown that they, these agents slow the progression of kidney disease. So there have been uh, a number of landmark trials. The first was this one called Credence, which was published in 2019 and looked at the use of these agents with people living with diabetes and, and kidney disease, and it showed that it, it slowed progression. The next big pivotal trial was the one called DAPA-CKD, and this extended the uh, group of patients that they included. Uh, there was people with less leakage of protein, less proteinuria, more advanced um, kidney disease with lower, lower EGFRs. And it also included about a third of the patients did not have diabetes. And again, we saw protection uh, to suggest that anyone with chronic kidney disease and um, proteinuria would benefit from these agents. And then the third landmark trial was the EMPA kidney, which was published just at the start of this year. And they, they've pushed the boundaries a bit further, going a little bit lower with, with a reduction in kidney function and um, uh, even higher, so those with preserved kidney function but, but leaking protein. And once again, we see protection, although it's certainly very much skewed to those that are, are leaking protein, which to me suggest that these are the people that tend to progress quite rapidly. So this is where we're getting best bang for our buck. I quite liked this, this uh, modelling data that was done uh, essentially off the, the Creedon study. And they, they took the, the average person engaged in this trial, which was age about uh, 60, EGFR about 56. I think of EGFR like a percentage, so about 56% kidney function. And they modelled what the likely progression of, of kidney disease might look like. In the orange line is what we would do as previously standard of care, and that's really control blood pressure with um, medications called ACE inhibitors or ARBs, a very common medication that's, that's prescri prescribed. And you can see that the um, trajectory of, of kidney function was one of decline over the next 10 or so years. By adding in these SGLT2 inhibitors, you can see that the, the slope of the decline was really blunted, a much slower decline, uh, with potentially saving 15 years from reaching kidney failure and needing dialysis. And that's pretty significant, and that's pretty significant for the, for the person um, and for the, for the, the, for the economics of, um, of, of kidney disease. And I quite liked this quote, and I think uh, emphasises that if we can treat and, and manage a condition much earlier, particularly something like chronic kidney disease, it leads to a higher quality of life um, and able to maintain more of day-to-day -day activities, including keeping a job. And, and this is really important if you're the person living with kidney disease. So how do these agents protect the kidney? And um, this is a, a, a somewhat simplified diagram from this uh, reference if you want greater detail. And I think many of these mechanisms will sound quite familiar to this audience. Um, and this is what I, I think I wanted to try and um, highlight, that the way these agents work is they block the SGLT2 receptor in the kidney. There's also um, an SGLT1 receptor, which is my, um, there is some blockage, but primarily it's SGLT2 in the kidney. So you don't absorb uh, glucose and you wee it out. Uh, and when you're weeing it out, uh, it reduces your blood glucose level and we reduce insulin and we get some weight loss and we shift metabolism from carbohydrate to ketones. We get a reduction in blood pressure 
uh, and um, combined, this is how it seems to exert its positive effect on both the heart and kidney. Um, and so if you ask a lot of people how SGLT2 inhibitors work, they'll say it's, it's very complex, it's multifactorial, and there's, there's lots of, on the original figure, there is lots of, lots of potential mechanisms. But I think if we, if we come back to basics, it's, it's blocking glucose absorption and we're getting the, the, um, the, the, the downstream effects. So what about in, uh, how can this marry with something like low carb um, in, in, in chronic kidney disease? So the first thing to say is if you have kidney disease, you're very likely, well, you will be metabolically unwell. I mentioned before that type 2 diabetes is the most common cause of kidney disease. And then if you don't have diabetes um, and have kidney disease, you're very likely to have prediabetes insulin resistance. So it's very bi-directional. So essentially, um, all people with chronic kidney disease have some degree of, of um, poor metabolic health. So I thought it would be useful just to look at the, the two in parallel. So this is what SGLT2 inhibitors do. They increase the glucose in your urine. You wee out about 80 grams of sugar a day, which is about two cans of Coke. Um, and not surprisingly, we then get some induction of weight loss, uh, reduced blood pressure. I've already sh mentioned it shifts the metabolism from carbohydrates to ketones. Interestingly, there's a decrease in triglycerides and an increase in LDL. Just let that one land for a moment. Um, an increase in uric acid excretion, uh, increased diversity of, micro of the microbiome. Uh, but like with all medications, there are some uh, potential side effects. There's been a very large meta-analysis done, and I'll show you some detail on that in a moment. But really, the, the main side effects that I warn uh, people about is of um, thrush, and it's, it's genital thrush. And that can be obviously really awful and really difficult to treat, so I certainly warn people about that. There was a lot of concern early on about urinary tract infections, um, kidney, acute kidney injury, all sorts of things which uh, doesn't seem to have been borne out. And then there's this risk of uh, euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. So if we compare that with low-carb nutrition, we probably would eat 80 grams plus less. So um, we, we know that it reduces body weight, reduces blood pressure, we get a shift in metabolism, reduces triglycerides in some people. We see a rise in, in LDL. Uh, we get an increase in uric acid excretion. Uh, increased diversity of the microbiome, and I guess the side effects are more energy, improved concentration, and better sleep. So just I wanted to go back to this is from the DAPA CKD trial um, just to show what introducing these agents do in terms of slowing progression of, of kidney disease and, and reaching um, uh, end-stage renal failure. And you can see that these, these are, so this is placebo and standard of care. So this is on top of, of ACE inhibitors or, or angiotensin receptor blockers, the ARBs. And you introduce something like uh, dapagliflozin, which is the only one that's currently listed on the PBS in Australia for kidney disease. And these curves, they separate and they separate very quickly. So this is at only four months and they're starting to separate. And Lorraine's already talked about um, relative risk reduction, absolute risk reduction, but in terms of number needed to treat only 19, 19 patients. But what I wanted to highlight is that it, it doesn't go to zero. There is still, we still have people that will progress. Um, and in my experience, people with renal disease are, are very insulin resistant. So it may be that we're not um, even though they're reducing their insulin, we're, we're not able to get it down far enough. And that's potentially one of the, the concerns that we have moving forward. So the question is, can, can these agents be combined, combined with low-carb nutrition? And this was probably spawned really from last year's meeting when this became a bit of a, a hot topic of discussion. And, you know, could these... Could this combined therapeutic approach be additive, synergistic? Alternatively, could it be detrimental? 
And there is some animal studies that have been published um, which shows that potentially combining these therapies is beneficial. Uh, so in one study, we, there was benefit in re reducing glycemia, interestingly, without an increase in ketosis. There was one study that actually showed differential effects on body composition and metabolic profiles, despite the table that I just showed you showing a, very, a lot of similarity. Uh, and in another study combined with calorie restriction, there was a synergistic effect with improved insulin resistance, kidney function and blood pressure. So really, it sounds that it might be um, really helpful. And uh, there is a, a researcher, Marcus Shaman, in Austria, who's actually doing this in humans, combining SGLT2 inhibition with low-carb nutrition. So let's watch this space. So what are the risks? I mentioned before that the main side effects for SGLT2 inhibitors are thrush and then this concept called euglycemic ketoacidosis. And this is where your blood sugar does not necessarily rise high and you get acidotic. So very different to type 1, uh, people with type 1 who get ketoacidosis, but nevertheless is, very, is potentially dangerous. And when these agents first came onto the market, this was a major concern. Um, and then there was a number of case reports that came out of um, increase or, or ketoacidosis in the setting of low-carb keto nutrition. I have to say many of those reports, it, it, it became clear that the person had undiagnosed type, two, uh, type 1 diabetes or LADA, uh, and that's a really important consideration. So this is the Lancet meta-analysis that I mentioned just before, and I've just pulled out the figure for ketoacidosis. And they've uh, brought, uh, divided this into people with underlying diabetes and without diabetes. If we look at across the board with people with diabetes, there's a, 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 a relative risk of twofold if, um, of, of ketoacidosis. So it, it's increased still really small numbers considering we've got um, a large number of, of patients. But if you're one of those 120 people, then it's obviously a very significant um, uh, adverse event for you. In the absence of diabetes, there was one in nearly 8,000 people. And that one person was someone that was in, in hospital very unwell. So essentially, if you don't have diabetes, your risk is... is negligible. If you do have diabetes, then there is a twofold increase. And I think this really highlights um, and supports um, literature that came out in animal studies showing that for ketoacidosis to occur, you required both insulinopenia, so very little insulin, plus dehydration, which I think is a marker of being unwell. So if you're an unrecognised if you have unrecognised type 1 diabetes or LADA, you will have insulinopenia and it doesn't take much to, be, to develop the dehydration or become unwell. Um, and uh, similarly, I think that explains what was happening with this one person without diabetes but who was extremely unwell. So uh, after last year's meeting with my colleagues here, Penny and, and Alok, we, we thought, well... Are we, how can we integrate these two therapies, which I think are both very important? And if you're living with kidney disease, I feel that it's, we, we need to be able to offer, we, we, we certainly need to be talking to pa our patients with, about um, things like SGLT2 inhibitors. And so we, we wrote a perspective on this um, and put this proposed algorithm together that if you have chronic kidney disease uh, in the presence of type 2 diabetes, a really important component is to ensure that you're not an unrecognised type 1 or you don't have LADA. Uh, if once we've excluded LADA, institute a low-carb diet, and then, of course, there'll need to be some probably medication adjustments, hopefully ceasing sulfonylureas, reducing insulin, which would be great. And I often find, you know, there's, we need to rationalise diuretics and, and high blood pressure medications as well. And I also need to do that when I in introduce things like SGLT2 inhibitors. If you don't have type 2 diabetes, then we can institute um, the, the low-carb diet 
and then we bring in the SGLT2 inhibitors. And I think a really crucial part of this is to ensure that we're talking about um, a sick day management plan. And why I think it's really important that we start considering medications as an adjunct to lifestyle therapy, and although our guidelines always have lifestyle as foundational, it's potentially not given as much emphasis um, by clinicians as it should. But I think there are many advantages of low-carb nutrition, which we've already heard about. By getting the foundations right, it allows for the lowest possible of doses of medications, and I think that's really important in terms of efficacy and minimising side effects. There may actually be potential greater effect. I think your medications will definitely work if we've got the basics right. And I think it's actually really reassuring that the risk of, of the, probably the most feared complication, which is the acidosis, is low by combining the, the two therapies. So how does this work practically? And so this is a, a, um, a patient that is, was referred to me by, by a colleague. Uh, and uh, this is a 55-year-old woman who has a, a family history of metabolic syndrome with her father, I think, with type 2 diabetes, and has a fasting insulin herself of, of 38. And has had hypertension since the age of, of 17. But interestingly, we had two pregnancies, no complications, no, no hypertension during pregnancy, which I thought was quite interesting, no preeclampsia, all the things that we really get concerned about. And she was referred to me with, with chronic kidney disease. And the story had been um, really high blood pressure and then an episode earlier in the year of, of renal pain. She was noted to have hematuria, a big drop in kidney function at that point in time. And um, when I saw her, things were starting to resolve in terms of her kidney function um, on blood tests, but she was still leaking a lot of protein in the urine and she also had blood in her urine. And that to me suggests a lot of inflammation happening uh, within the kidney. I actually went on to have uh, get a biopsy done of, of, of her kidney, which confirmed this condition called IgA nephropathy. Big name, but all it means, it's, a, it's a, quite a common condition in the community. Uh, we all have this protein called IgA. It's an immunoglobulin. It, it's one of the proteins that helps keeps us healthy. And in, in some people, for some reason, there's a lot we don't know about this condition, um, some people will deposit IgA in their kidney. Of those people, three quarters of them, nothing happens. It just sits there, doesn't cause any problems. And in 25%, it will really incite inflammation. And that inflammation can be quite aggressive to less aggressive. So it's a, it's a, uh, a term that encompasses what I think is, is multiple different conditions, uh, but we call this IgA nephropathy. Uh, now, this woman was very um, health literate, very, uh, um, very nutrition wise, and has, has been on paleo since 2012, low carb in 2016, dabbled in the ketogenic diet in 2022, and was carnivore by the time she saw me. So, how did we how do we manage this? So, I was trying to work out well, how do I put all this together? And I think there's obviously there's obviously a genetic predisposition predisposition that underpins things like metabolic syndrome and probably to a point um, hypertension, um, but then there's a lot of environmental factors. Uh, so I think certainly genetics was playing a role with insulin resistance and maybe hypertension. And then she's got this thing called IgA nephropathy, which is definitely contributing to chronic kidney disease. And I'm sure for someone that was on carnivore to have a fasting insulin of 38 was contributing to, to inflammation. Um, and then you can see once you've got one of these conditions, it, we've got this very vicious cycle that, uh, that just develops. And so how are we managing um, to, uh, uh, this person's condition? Really keen to, to maintain good nutrition and um, wants to do low-carb carnivore fasting. She's, she's pushing all the boundaries. So we're, we're certainly continuing with, with low-carb um, she's already on, a, on an angiotensin receptor blocker for, um, for her high blood pressure. So I have introduced a, an SGLT2 inhibitor for this, for this woman um, and uh, counselled regarding sick day management. So if you're unwell, you stop. You also should stop your 
angiotensin receptor blocker. If you're unwell, it's like your blood pressure will drop. These are things that can actually make you feel worse. So sick day management is quite important. And um, we, she was going to do some keto um, monitoring, particularly if she dabbles in a little bit of fasting, um, which I'm hoping she won't do straight up, <laughs> maybe down the track, but maybe we'll, we'll see how we go. So look, I think chronic kidney disease is, is really common. It's one of these conditions, it's grumbling away for a long time before there are symptoms. And it may be that we can't reverse chronic kidney disease like we can reverse diabetes, but I think we can certainly stop it getting any worse. And I'm sure that there is an element of inflammation, so we may see some improvement. But when you've got chronic kidney disease, you've got a lot of scarring in your kidney, so I don't expect massive massive improvements. I think foundational, we, we really, and it reminds me of the, the metabolic pyramid that we talked, uh, talked about yesterday, the importance of these, these non-pharmacological measures. And we talk very broadly about nutrition and that does, nutrition doesn't mean anything. And I think we need to be quite specific here. And um, I, I think low carb nutrition is a really important um, therapeutic um, strategy for people with chronic kidney disease. But I think we do need to acknowledge that often, and for some people, we do need to think about some management. Um, uh, there needs to be some adjunct therapies that uh, should at least be offered. But key to it is that we do this with, with our patients, so it's a shared agenda. And ultimately, we all want the same thing, and that is health and wellbeing. Um, and so I, I think anything that can you know, get us to the, the pointy end of that pyramid is, is a good thing. Thank you.